highlight some stuff that the um, Power Code uh, management system will do in conjunction with us. Okay. So uh, I brought up one. I'm not going to punish you with a lot of slides today. Uh, what I'll bring, and I have one slide here that shows the logical and physical components of our system. And just let people know when I use certain acronyms like the PRE and the PIC, uh, what I'm talking about. So we have a device called the PRE. That's our enforcement node. That sits, um, sits on the wire. And out of the box, it just monitors all the traffic that goes through your network. And we'll be able to present some uh, in-depth details about all the stuff that goes uh, through the device. Uh, out of the box, we're a series of two port bridges. Uh, transparent bridges. We don't have any forwarding cable, our cache, MAC table, or anything like that. We're more of a, a bump on the network instead of a hop. So as I mentioned, through the box, we'll be able to show you um, what all your users are doing by application. We'll show you uh, what percentage of your networks are doing, uh, what types of applications, what type, what groups of applications, and um, all that can be shown uh, within the PRE. So the PRE has a 500 gig on onboard hard drive. That's able to show, um, or is able to house this uh, device next here, or in the middle here, called a PIC. And that's the intelligence center. Think of that as where all the statistics lives, as well as the intelligence that will allow you to pull real-time statistics and archive historical statistics for uh, analytics and reporting and all that. So the PRE and the PIC are the two uh, two uh, Procera devices that um, that play into it. So the PRE will do shaping, filtering, and it'll do the actual collection of statistics. The PRE will store the statistics and give you access to real-time stats. Now the Power Code manage Management Box uh, will act as a um, a management entity into our PRE system. So it'll automatically create rules, it'll create subscriber identifications. So you don't have to look at subscribers just by IP addresses. You'll have a, a, a subscriber ID associated with those IPs. So if there's multiple IPs associated with a single user, um, we can show that uh, accordingly. So it could be a user ID and they'll map a MAC address to the IP address. It'll come up and we'll know who it is. So you'll have uh, the ability to re, uh, redirect delinquent subscribers uh, over to a, uh, a, uh, a redirection page. And that will be leveraged through the packet logic intelligence touching what's called an uh, inject rule. And that will strip out a URL out of wherever you subs a particular subscriber is going. And we'll push them wherever we want to. So we can, we can group subscribers by access points, give you the ability to look at not only subscribers uh, individually, but subscribers by location. So you'll see uh, who's off of what tower, and then uh, look at all the individuals on each uh, location. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show um, as far as the slide where it's going. I'd rather spend my time showing you the actual product. So what we're looking at right now is the uh, Packet Logic client, and I'm connected into the PRE or the enforcement node that sits on the uh, network. This client can run on Windows, Mac, or Linux. And where we're connected right now is what's called LiveView. LiveView will show you five second snapshots of all the traffic going through the box, and it's presented to you in different formats. The local host view shows you uh, uh, by, by internal IP addresses. And I've taken this and um, formatted this in means that you can see and recognize. So if you have a routed network, I can show you by location. So take location one and replace this with, like, say, tower one. Everybody that's hanging off of tower one can be associated with a given uh, IP subnet or VLAN. There's lots of different ways to associate uh, these locations. Most likely it would be a VLAN, or I'm sorry, a subnet. And then uh, all the users come on the subnet, and you can look at top talkers accordingly. Notice that we have uh, the, each of these uh, entities showed up with incoming, outgoing traffic, total traffic, connections per second, inbound and outbound, established, unestablished connections, as well as a quality metric. These quality metrics are derived by looking for TCP re retransmissions, as well as missed sequence numbers within the TCP header. So we can look at things by location. We can also look at the network as a whole. 
So if I right click on the uh, all internal IPs, I can show this network wide and use a graph. So the graph can show the incoming, outgoing, and total bandwidth, incoming and outgoing connections per second, established and unestablished connectors, connections, and then that quality metric which I'd mentioned just a minute ago. So if we go into the internal IP addresses, you can show all the users in the entire network. All these columns can be uh, stacked up, and you can pick your top talkers accordingly. So I grab one of these top talkers, and so I double click into it. It goes into what's called host view. Host view shows you all the application a particular subscriber uh, is using. So this happens to be uh, where they're the client. So this is where they send the first SYN in their handshake for setup. And as servers, this is the ones that respond to that SYN. There's different ways to, dis to uh, display this. So right now, we're just dis displaying this where the uh, client shows up. And there's a client and where they're going to. Right, so we can lay it out and brace all that information down here, what port, where they're going to, um, or where they're coming from, where they're going to, all broken down. So if I change it to server, it'll s rearrange everything, lay it out for you, show you by port, and there, off you go there. There's deeper dives that we'll go into a little bit later on. So if it suffices to say this is searchable, you just type in an IP address that will bring it to the subscriber that you're looking for. So that's by internal IP. Now, uh, some things that people are concerned about is DDoS stuff. So here we're able to, while we're not an IDS IPS, we're able to mitigate some of the uh, symptoms of uh, a DDoS attack or users that are uh, misbehaving. So I have set up what's called a host trigger. A host trigger will monitor all the user's uh, characteristics of their connections. And it's uh, right here in this alarm bell. And what you can do is you can set up certain thresholds of behavior. So one of the thresholds that makes sense is the unestablished connections. Unestablished connections can be indicative of somebody who's doing port scans, SYN floods, um, if well as if people are uh, affected by botnet attacks and things. So it's unestablished connections where they're trying to bring up a whole bunch of connections at one time. We can see this behavior, and we can take action on the behavior. So the action could be something as simple as sending an SNMP trap, logging it, or we can associate um, the individual users with what are called net objects. And this net object I have, I titled just bad user. And bad user, in turn, can be associated with a uh, a TCP reject filter or a walled garden, and keeping the users uh, mitigated while they're displaying the uh, behavior that we don't want to see. If you notice that the actual uh, amount of users contracts and um, expands, that's because we'll self we'll self heal or put the users back into the user community community when that behavior stops. Okay, so if there's a, a DOS attack or an, a botnet attack inside your network where the internal users are exhibiting these behaviors, we can in turn um, stop the behavior, so limit the damage on the attack, and then let the users back when that stops. Um, that could, this could also be in conjunction with a, um, a portal to move over, users over. We can also limit inbound um, DDoS attacks or DOS attacks by using shaping policies to limit how many connections per second inbound, how many total connections any host from the internet can access your network with. So there's lots of ways to use our product uh, to get the behavior you want. Now this PSM could just be just as easy be the, um, the power code management system. And this is where you can show users by a user ID. So I've created user IDs where I've associated IP addresses with users, multiple users with an abstract, which happens to be a name. And then in turn, I can take these users and associate them with a policy, silver, bronze, gold, unprovisioned, knowing I have to associate this user with a policy. Or you can take those users and in turn, uh, set up users who don't pay their bill and suspend them. 
So that's as simple as just taking an attribute and doing a flip switch from no to yes. So if the user is uh, not paying their bill, they can be put in the no bucket, which will turn and just put them into a portal page, please call billing, and uh, we'll fix you up. So that's with the um, the PS or the the power code uh, management system tied in. We also can show IPv6 traffic. Our system is fully IPv6 uh, compatible. We can also be a BGP peer, where we can look at on. Um, we can basically suck down a uh, entire route table and associate endpoint um, IP addresses with internal and external AS paths. I'll show you that a little later as far as where it would be set up. Okay, so that's looking at um, users by internal IP address. We can also look at them by services. We have over 2,000 service, services that we can discreetly categorize uh, subscribers with. Uh, we update our signatures every week, which is the most often in the industry, and we have the most complete signature database in the industry. You'll have a very low amount of un unknown traffic with our system. And that visibility allows you to control the traffic to a great deal. So I just uh, parsed this according to totals. If I click, click, say, HTTP, if you look down the bottom down here, we'll have a listing of all um, of an application. And then it allows you to drill down further into it. So any one of these applications has a little uh, explanation of what it is. This particular one has links to the RFCs for it, applications that use it. What I wanted to show you here is all the properties that we can pull out of an individual connection to give you a detailed view and detailed analytics of what is actually going on in these connections. So if you wanted to say no, what your if you wanted to know uh, what types of devices were accessing Netflix in your uh, network, we can take this device name category and then tie it to say Netflix uh, application, set that up in a property object and be able to display all the different devices that are accessing Netflix in your network. That can be used over time, and you can, uh, pay, you can uh, look and uh, plan on what types of devices are, are using a lot. You can see how many users out there, um, you know, what, what the traffic mix between users using iPads. So there's an iOS update, you'll know that there'll be an impact on your network. So we can turn around, so that's, that's that. If you want to know the users themselves that are using HTTP in the network, all you need to do is double click. So here's the users that are hosting HTTP servers. Here's the users that are using HTTP itself. We'll resolve the uh, IP address to the URLs. So if I parse it on top talkers, say I drill into the connection, we'll be able to Pardon me. We'll go into the connection. I'll double click in it and we'll get what's called connection view. Connection view gives you a, real, a whole lot of information that is good not only for analytics but also for troubleshooting. So we can turn around and we'll get simple stuff that you would expect like five tuple information, source and de destination IP, port information, as well as what the service, the base service is. Um, one thing I wanted to mention as far as our services themselves. Uh, we don't. We're not like Netflix or IP, IP Flow. We're not looking at TCP ports to associate uh, applications. What we do is we have an in-depth database that goes in and looks at traffic setup and the establishment of connections at a byte-by-byte -byte level. So if someone uses, say, peer-to-peer uh, -peer uses port 80 to try to masquerade as HTTP to get to your network, not going to happen with us because we'll know that it's uh, the behavior is peer-to-peer uh, -peer and what type of peer-to-peer -peer it is, and we'll be able to control it. So we're very, we're very powerful. There's a, a low amount of uh, miscategorized traffic uh, because of the manner uh, that we analyze the traffic with. So I need to remember to say that. So what we'll do in here, we'll also tell you what shaping policies we're associated with for a given uh, flow. We'll show you what priority within our system we have the traffic. We have 10 levels of priority um, well, from 1 to 10. And we also have a 0, which is just a, a express category that never gets dropped and never gets shaped, uh, that basically is pushed right through the box. But we'll be able to tell you what priority a particular uh, connection matches to. We'll give you VLAN tag information, when the TCP session started, characteristics about 
the um, connection. We also can show you what category this HTTP traffic fell into. So I've got uh, a Symantec categorization, uh, category intelligence database loaded on my demo system. And what it does, it has uh, a table of hashed URLs. And all those hashed URLs are categorized by Symantec's into uh, categories. So this uh, URL, uh, hitase.com, matches up with uh, a search category. So if it's pornography, if it's violence against women, if it's this, this, is that, it can be cat all these applications be categorized not only for network intelligence, but an offer uh, for reporting, uh, filtering, uh, or shaping. We tell you what statistic rules we're matching on a particular category, on a particular connection, as well as how much latency our shaping objects are adding to a given connection. Uh, this is important when you're troubleshooting a problem. gives you a good idea of whether a particular shaper is too aggressive or not. You can also look at um, how many drops we um, are adding to a, a particular session or how many drops inbound. This is just for the shaper. MPLS tags in and out will show disserve code points, what physical channel through our system, as well as round-trip timeouts uh, for the system. So let me close that. So we've got these 2,000 uh, signatures on the system. What we can do is categorize these by categories. So instead of looking at just HTTP, you can look at your categories and say, what is your major uh, consumer of bandwidth in your network? You open up file sharing, and within file sharing, you have peer-to-peer. -peer. And within peer-to-peer, -peer, you have BitTorrent. Within BitTorrent, here's how all the, uh, the consumption is in BitTorrent encrypted. Uh, BitTorrent transfer, if you open it up and double click on it, you'll have a list of all the users in your network that are using BitTorrent transfer, broken all the way down. So this is, this is how um, we also uh, group our filters and shapers. So we can turn around and create these policies and leverage this nesting. So if I wanted to create a, um, if I wanted to create a policy to block peer-to-peer, -peer, I could take uh, you know, streaming media. I could take file sharing peer-to-peer and it would cover all these applications. So I choose this object, and I wanted streaming media peer-to-peer. -peer. It covers all these applications. So two objects cover over 100 applications. It's a very powerful and efficient way to create uh, rules. I'll show you that quickly you know, or in a little while. So here we are with the uh, live view. The live view itself, uh, mind you, it's five second snapshots over a, um, an hour period. After that hour period, we'll take that data and we'll push it to our PIC, our, uh, in our statistical database. So here's a view of the statistical database. As much hard drive space um, as you have to store the data uh, is as long as you can look at it. It could be a very long time. Uh, so a couple thousand users, maybe three, four thousand users on uh, one of these devices can last you uh, well over a year to two years. So we can look at this traffic. You can look at by the week, month, quarter, uh, whatever custom you want to look at. It'll in turn uh, give you the same granularity of data uh, that was stored a year ago as it was stored today. We don't summarize any of the data. So if you want to look at packet loss, uh, over a year-long period on an application, we'll give you that data and the granularity will be the same as it was stored today. So we already have set up over a week. Here's some of the stuff that we can pull off in the individual packets. Round trip time, number of packets, packet loss over time, uh, how many uh, sub-items, meaning how many uh, devices that match a certain criteria, how much shaping latency, shaping drop, how many connections of each application. There's a lot more than this, but this is just what I chose on a top level. 
So if I went and chose, say, uh, traffic, there's lots of ways to show uh, the individual traffic. This is actually showed by individual application. This can be presented as a percentage bar chart, as a line chart, and the line chart shows traffic over a measured period. So this gives you a snapshot over time or as a stacked area chart. So the stacked area chart gives you a really easy way to look at things as far as uh, analytics. So say I want to look at incoming traffic. So here's all my incoming traffic over the measured period of time. And I want to look at this traffic and compare how much uh, HTTP related applications are um, being used at this time. So all I need to do is open up the services and click HTTP, click media, HTTP media streaming, flash video over HTTP. See how they stack upon one another? Uh, HTTP download and HTTP audio stream. There's, there's others in there. But the point being is I can run my mouse across and I can see how much is being used at any given period of time. If I want to look in further detail, I just hold my shift down, drag it across, and I can zoom further in. I can zoom further in than that if I want to and look at traffic over time. This can be copied, dropped into a document. I can also create um, bookmarks. So this can be taken and drug right into a folder. So I can turn with this and then rename this into, uh, let's see here. 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 I did delete instead of rename. Zoomed in. And then when I want to come back uh, later on and look at something over a week, I'll double click and have this. I can take this and export this to the desktop. I can export all these different folders that I've created and export them either as a comma separated variable file or a PDF. So if I export this to the desktop, I can just minimize. And um, where is my thing that says weekly? I hope I did that to the desktop. Let me just check. Downloads, of course. Okay. So now I should have a folder in here that says weekly. This is there is the weekly right here. It's double-clicked, and you can turn around and have all these different views um, there. Here's one that I created with my last version, which is actually a little more intelligent than the one I just showed you. So you show your top 10 uh, applications, your top 10 subscribers by, by volume, web browsing traffic, how much inbound, outbound in total, and then traffic as a whole with some categories uh, associated with it. We also have the ability to do uh, a little bit um, more user-friendly um, reports. This is a report that's run against the same distribution uh, that I built the stats distribution. So this information can be sent uh, higher to higher ups or people who may not uh, be as familiar with the packet logic system. Uh, it's very easy. You can look at here. We get traffic overview, inbound, outbound total, number of subscribers, traffic per subscribers, bandwidth usage over the measured period of time, connections per second over the measured period of time, your top ten protocols, amount of traffic, and what percentage of your total traffic it is. Uh, same with users. Break it down: inbound, outbound total, percentage of total traffic, uh, top streaming video applications how many subscribers are using and what percentage of your subscribers use it. Top file sharing applications, same information. Streaming video subs, um, what applications, how many users are using it. Break this down as a pie chart as per, you know, with percentages. You can give you a list of your top 50 streaming video subscribers, what application they're using, how much bandwidth they're consuming. Same thing with file sharing. There's top file shares in your network. Top tom, top dot coms by connections and by traffic consumed. Same thing for the dot nets. 
and we have web browsing bandwidth and the web browsing quality over time. Now we have canned reports for this that are for Netflix and YouTube also. And uh, our system can have reports created. They're just an XML format. So that is your uh, statistics view. I can show you a few more interesting things. So this is the same kind of view that would be available for, say, uh, we want to look at web destinations. And you want to look at file sharing and peer-to-peer. -peer. What are the top peer-to-peer -to -peer file sharing um, locations? So here's the Pirate Bay. If you want to look at the Pirate Bay, here's the usage over time for your subscribers. You want to look at um, anything with .orgs as a whole, do the line chart, and here you go total for that. So there's lots of ways to tie it in there. Let's uh, move this down a little bit. So, so categorization also, this is leveraging that um, Symantec database. So say we go into HTTP, we go into entertainment, and I want to show, let me go for the the week look before. It's October, same week. So we go into, say, entertainment. We can dive into the entertainment and where the individual users are actually going to. And where are we here with the, the users? This is the same view as you would get with the, um, the power code um, view. We can look at users by um, device, double click on them, look at the consumption of traffic. Here. There we go. Double click on a user, drill down into the categories they're using, get their use over time. Maybe you want to see the pie chart, what percentage of traffic and what they're going where. So there's lots of different things we can show on, here's a good one, internet device types. So what type of devices are users accessing the internet with? So we have the user breaking down by uh, Windows types. If I want to go and look at, we have 260, 16 Windows machines. Uh, five iPhones, four Macs, two Androids, two computers, iPad, Ruko, and, and uh, Hulu, I'm sorry, and an iPod. There's, we can show you the uh, devices. What this is ha more handy for is you can show, for say, Windows machines, you can turn around and break it down by traffic and show what traffic individual users are using or groups of users are using. So if I want to break this down, yep. I can show like the iPhone itself. We show what user are using, drill down into this, break down the users, and then what users are going to you know, individually. So that's it. That's a, uh, a high-level overview for the statistics. It's very flexible, very in-depth. What I'd like to show you is how we create uh, objects and filters. How, how would you control um, shaping? So what I'll use is an example of uh, limiting Netflix or limiting streaming media. So some people will be challenged, and you can limit this to, say, at a, uh, a network-wide level or at a tower level and an individual level. So if I wanted to create shaping objects, here's my shaping object area. So I wanted to have limits on the, say you have a gigabit worth of bandwidth out to the internet. Network uh, streaming, streaming media. And we have a thing here that's called split by none. That means all users matching this policy will have, um, to match, oh, we'll have to share this individual shaper. So out of a gig, I want no more than 600 megs uh, to use streaming media. So here I'll go 600 inbound, and why not 600 outbound? So that will be at the network wide, and then I want to do at a tower, and the tower, and the towers.
say they have no more than 100 megs, 100 megs, and we want no more than, say, 60 megs at a particular tower full of streaming media. Sixty megs for a tower, and then we want to do and have no one user no use no more than um, two and a half megs of streaming media. Now we can set a thing up and set it by subscriber. And I'm going to go in here, and this will be the power code by subscriber. And I say no no subscriber can use more than two point five. 2.5 of per sub streaming streaming media. Now, in order to do this, this would this would probably save the average network 25% uh, bandwidth very quickly. I'm going to just create one net object that I need for this. My my tower. And this tower would be an IP4 range of 10.2.0.0. And this would be slash 24. OK. Now, I'm going to create a rule that's or three rules that are totally will control streaming media at the tower, at the network wide, at the individual subscriber. So let's show you how this is done. And this is actually pretty quick. If I can do this in a demo, you can take care of your network post haste. So this would be uh, network wide streaming. So when we create a rule in the packet logic, it would be very easy to say who. Oh, that's all your users in your network. And I'll say what. The what is streaming media, and that covers Netflix, Hulu, uh, YouTube, all that HTTP download. Who, what, what do I want to do with them when they match? I want to apply the network streaming media to it. So I just controlled streaming media for the whole network. Now I want to go and do it at a tower level. So tower streaming who and I select tower what we take advantage of this nesting uh, rule. And then I'll do tower streaming media. And then I'll create a last rule called per subscriber streaming media. Per sub streaming. Once again, who? Now be all internal users. What? Streaming media streaming media. And what do I want to do with them? Per user streaming media. OK, so I'm done. So what have I done? I've gone and said network wide, anybody that's using the network to get streaming media, they have to share network streaming media bandwidth. And these, the sum total of all users cannot exceed more than 600 megs. Per tower, streaming means anybody that's associated with that tower tries to do streaming media, they're limited to the streaming media bandwidth maximum. Now we can place games with this and have a minimum and have borrowing. So if there's extra bandwidth available for streaming media, we can do this. But I'm just using this as an example. And then we want to make sure that the users themselves don't use um, like uh, HD um, Super HD video on Netflix or an HD thing so that one or two users can't, one, 
uh, dominate the entire bandwidth of their home. And two, two or three users aren't going to make the rest of the tower uh, congested. So what I'm going to do is say, uh, you know, I'm going to change this from low, so I'm going to change this to per subscriber. So I'm going to say anybody that's set up by power code into the system um, has, in trying to use streaming media, we're going to limit them to that two and a half megs per user. It gives them a very acceptable bandwidth, a fine video, but they're not going to use 20 or 30 megs to stream the uh, HD stream uh, down, to their, down to their TV. So this controls the bandwidth. All of our rules use the same logic. And we could do things like peer-to-peer -peer mitigation, peer-to-peer -peer shaping. We have uh, things called volume-based shaping. So with the, each of these rules, and the shaping rules, let's uh, grab one of these, we have advanced options. So within the advanced options, we have things called uh, brown con uh, connection fairness. And what that does is it has a high water, low water mark within the queues. And it determines when um, packets will be dropped. It gives you five marks to say packets might be dropped, and then it will actually drop one of the packets, allow TCP windowing to um, manage congestion. Virtual queuing, this allows for um, prioritization and um, forwarding of time-sensitive traffic like, uh, like VoIP, things like that. We have the ability to do byte counters, so this allows you to do things like metered billing through the system. Uh, it also allows you to do a thing called volume-based shaping. So if you have a, a usage that are uh, consumption basis and you want to offer another level of fair use, you can say, okay, I'll do this on a per user basis, uh, per substream media. So I'm going to open this up. I'm going to add the byte counters. And I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to have at, say, build this real quick. Say at 100 megs, I'm going to lower this to 1 meg, and at 1,000 megs, I'm going to lower this to 0.25. These, these amounts are whatever you want to set them at. The way this rules sets over, this is a sliding window three time period thing, so over 24 hours measured in eight hour increments. If a user uses more than 100 megs of streaming media, I want to lower their streaming media bandwidth from 2.5 megs to 1 meg. If a user uses over 1,000 megs of streaming media over that measured 8-hour period, or I'm sorry, over the 24-hour period, I can lower their bandwidth down to uh, 0.25 megs. So it's like a sliding uh, window volume-based shaper. So as the time slides along and they go above and below these certain high water marks and low water marks of bandwidth, we can adjust their bandwidth. So that's something in your toolkit in case you need it. So our filtering rules. On filtering, we can do uh, accepts. We can do CCB rejects. We can drop things in a hole. We can rewrite the destination MAC to search copoint and uh, IP on a packet. We can divert packets from one channel through the system over to something like an IDS, IPS, a video groomer, what have you. We can also inject URLs in the packet. That's how we do the redirects over to portals. So all this stuff is there for you to use. Um, there's tons of stuff. Most of this stuff will be automated uh, as time goes on. There's a lot done with power code right now. Uh, and more and more of this thing, like the content logic, and that stuff is going to be integrated into the system, so it's automatically done through power code. But things that they, they can't do, they can, we can get in here and, and set it up uh, post-haste. So that's, with, that's the stuff. Other things we do need to do, so if they need to set user up, you can skill partitions, the user who can see what, who can control what, who can see what. So if you have certain logins, you may not want somebody to be able to look at what URLs uh, their neighbors are looking at. We can control that. We can also control where people log in from. This is an ACL uh, associated with it. Uh, backups to the system are easy. You just hit that backup button, and when you want to restore, you can control what you want to restore. Only portions of the configure all of it. The documentation on the system it's keyed to the version of the code's loading system, so this documentation comes up with the uh, actual uploads. 
with the ability to do P capture files. So think of this as TCP dump, a graphical TCP dump, but very, very granular and very strategic. Your MIBs are right there. Log viewer. And we have a thing for connection search. So say you get a takedown notice on traffic, you can turn around and go, OK, my takedown notice is for a particular IP address. And my particular IP address in this may be 10.2.202.186. And I want to search on that. So I'll get a list here of all the peer-to-peer um, traffic that this particular user was doing. So it'll turn around and not just be an IP address, since you have the, uh, the power code and you have the ability to resolve a username to an IP, you'll get the, you know, the start time, end time of the conversation, addresses, the port information, if there's uh, server host names associated with connection, like this, you'll see that, and you'll also get username information. So you don't have to go look in the firewalls to determine or the DHP server to say who owned what address when. This can all be exported to a CSD file for documentation purposes. And uh, last thing I do like to show when we're showing this stuff, I want to show our interactive support. So if there's a reason that you ever have to open a, a ticket with uh, Procera, We'll go into something upstairs. We have a, an IRC support room built right in. So these are all the engineers, the programmers, the SCs from around the world, as well as support people. Uh, this is me. I'm logged in and I monitor things. But in the general uh, help room, we can just go, let's go uh, test. And if I go into my client here, I can go over to here. And I can see the test, somebody responding back to me. And you've got the response from TechOps right away. So in addition to being able to call 800 number, log into uh, a customer portal, uh, also to be able to go in and do something like, uh, you know, call the Call send an email to email support at Networks.com. While you're in the middle of working something, you just bring this window up and start asking your questions. Uh, very helpful. So that is the that is the formal part of what I wanted to show you folks today. So let me see if I've got any questions. Let's see. Yeah, it looks like oh, we got on, a couple. So there was actually um, before we jump into those, Steve. There's a couple of things I was going to show quickly in Power Code. So oh, you there's, um, okay. so you know, Steve's kind of showing you all of this. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share some of my screen here. So, you know, you looked at this, and there's a lot of power in what you can do with the processor. And there's, you know, we've been using one in our network for about a year. And the challenging piece, I think, uh, especially for wireless ISPs, is that if you have people on a tower, they might be moving between access points, you're adding new customers, you're doing these things, and if you don't have an easy way of grouping people by APs, for example, you're going to do a lot of manual work to come in there and associate people. So that's part of what the, the integration is that we've done. So um, I was going to quickly show you a couple of things we've done to automate some of this. So Steve kind of showed you how to make a shaping rule in the packet logic client. Well, we also have a way to do it in Power Code. So I can come in here and similar to what Steve did, um, I can build rules. Now, the, the makeup of these rules is slightly different, and you can see this interface is kind of simplified in relation to what's in the packet logic. And we automate setting a lot of those things, like the, the brown um, fair queuing and stuff like that. We'll automatically set those when we build these rules. But, for example, let's say I wanted to say Netflix at two mags. I can build this rule. Well, let's stick with streaming media, much like Steve did. So I can come down here and select streaming media, and we're pulling these categories from a live Procera connected to Power Code in real time. So if you get new signatures, they'll be in Power Code automatically just because you have a, uh, a packet logic connected to your, your Power Code install. So now we only get two split buys in here, and the reason for this is there's really two ways to split with the integration. One is by individual users, and one is by a parent. So a parent can either be a service or it can be a device. 
and a device can be something like an access point or a router or a switch or something that these users are going to be connected to. Um, it can also be a service. So the internet service you're providing a customer with can have these roles associated with it. So let's, let's start with an example by subscriber. So if I go ahead and create this, and I have this rule called streaming media, two megs. You can see it matches streaming media. It's two megs each way, and it's by sub. So if I now go into my services, and I edit my fast internet service, down here I have this Procera shaping rules option. I can now pick the streaming media rule. Now what this will do, because it's split by sub, it's going to provide them with the speeds of this service, which is 25 down and 5 up. But if they try and use anything that matches streaming media, they'll get 2 megs. Now, because we split by subscriber, that means they're going to get 2 megs each. If I'd set this to parent, every user with this service would have to share that 2 meg bucket. So sharing that bucket on a service basis is probably not tremendously useful. But what we can do is apply this to devices. So. For example, let's say I say I look for my Cambium stuff. I've got a Cambium access point here. I can apply this to the AP. Now, if I applied it in the way that I have it set right now, every user connected to this AP is going to get two megs each. But I could also build another rule, and you can apply multiple rules here and do much like Steve did where I said 60 megs a tower. Well, we can say 5 megs on an AP, 10 megs on an AP, 20 megs on an AP, whatever we need. And the way these get correlated is by the parent-child relationship in power code. So one of the nice things we have here is as those user parent-child relationships change, in the back end, we're automatically updating those subscribers in the Procera box. So you don't have to go in and do all that stuff manually. Now, you probably, maybe, are still going to want to be able to build some manual rules, and we don't prohibit that in any way. You can still go in and build more complex things, do your statistics, put a, layer other rules on top of this. This is an easy way for you to automate um, having rules that are specific to APs or specific to services or both. And you can mix these together. So much like Steve showed, we can have a 2 meg per subscriber rule on the service. But on the AP, we don't allow the subscribers to exceed 10 megs in total. And whatever is the most stringent of those two rules is what's going to be applied. So while that 10 meg cap has not been hit, the users will all get 2 megs each once they hit that 10 meg cap we're going to start reducing the amount of bandwidth have and splitting it equally between the subs. So that's a little bit of what it looks like in PowerCode. There's a lot more we're going to show. Um, a lot of this is in the version 10 of PowerCode that's coming out, and uh, that's something we're going to do another webinar on in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, we do have a couple of questions I uh, was going to run through. So the first question we had was, is this a replacement for the existing BMU or an add-on? So that's a good question. The answer is both. Um, so what you'll do when you utilize a Procera device in Power Code is the Procera is going to replace the BMU from a rate limiting perspective and from a redirection perspective. So the Procera box will sit in line and it's going to do your rate limiting like the BMU would and redirect delinquent customers like the BMU would. The BMU can now sit out of line and it's going to do your DHCP for you because Procera doesn't do DHCP and it's going to do the network monitoring that we do today so we can ping devices, do SNMP queries, and that kind of thing. Um, you can also keep the BMU in line if you want and treat it as a standalone router. Uh, in V10, we have a new version of the PowerCode firmware coming out that's going to allow you to really use BMUs as standalone routers much more easily. And so it'll be an easy way for you to keep it in line in the network if you want to. So another question was about um, you know some of the potential difficulty of having to manage things in the packet logic, having to manage things in power code, and not having a central location to see all that info. So that's part of why I showed this piece. Um, you know, if you're trying to apply rules that would apply on an AP basis, on a service basis, you can do all of that in power code and never really use the packet logic client. If you are doing some more complex things in the client, then you wouldn't necessarily see that in power code. But one of the things we're doing as we move forward with this, is to continue building more complexity into power code to allow you to build these rules and add different kinds of uh, you know, filtering rules, more complex shaping rules, be able to group them in different ways, and to be able to pull some of those statistics in as well. So long term, our goal is that we don't, you don't have to use the client very much. But the reality is there's so much in the client that for us to completely essentially recreate that in power code is a pretty big undertaking. So. I think for most things, you know, you'll do most of it in Power Code, but there will be a couple of things you're going to do in a client for now. Uh, another question was about the statistics Steve was showing, whether we'll have to log in to look at those uh, through the PIC or the Packet Logic client, 
or if we'll pull them into power code. So right now what we pull in the power code is throughput usage. So uh, like on the BMU where we store historical bandwidth usage for a device, we can pull that data from um, a Procera box and store that for a customer. Today, I have that set up to just pull it as throughput. What I plan to do is then break that down by category. So within power code, you'll be able to see streaming media. Um, you know, if somebody's used, say, you know, 100 gigs this month, you'll be able to see a breakdown over time of how much of it was streaming media, how much of it was, uh, uh, you know, something else, whatever the different categories are, it's broken into. And I'd like to get that pushed all the way to the customer portal. It's probably not something that will be in the first release of version 10, but that's something we have pretty high on the list. Uh, someone asked if we can do this on a particular AP type. So you definitely can. Um, what you would want to do is build more specific device types rather than just having Cambium access point. I'd have something like, you know, Cambium PMP450 900 megahertz AP or something. And then as you add your APs in a power code, you'd associate them with that device type. You can then have specific rules by that device type. Um, and then that would allow you to apply these rules on a basis uh, on frequency, right? So your 900 megahertz APs might have more stringent rules than your 5 gig APs or your uh, 365 APs or whatever they might be. Um, somebody asked if we can see how much traffic's being used by PBS Kids. So, Steve, I don't think we could do that as a category, but you could build a statistics object that would match that property, right, where the URLs PBS Kids and store that? Sure. There's also um, a thing called Dynamic Live View that's uh, in beta right now that will allow you to parse uh, traffic and actually input uh, a URL and show all users using a particular URL at a given time. So it's sort of like uh, setting up a dynamic statistics object and pulling it up through the system. So I don't have it on this stuff on my box, but it, it is it is there. It's just ready to just about ready to come out. Okay, perfect. So today, even without that. You could build a statistics object to match oh, all of that and, you know, see that per yes. user. It's just a property object uh, with that uh, PBS Kids on it. And you just put it in and you match it uh, web browsing and this URL and show me how much and who's using it. So the next question we had was, how do you handle dedicated customers that are hooked up to a multi-point access point and have their own one-to-one -one bucket? Um, if they move from one AP to another, does the bucket stay with them? So that, you know, it depends on how you'd configure that. Um, probably the easiest thing to do would be to have a net object that would match on that particular customer's IP. And then you can build rules in a packet logic that would exclude that IP from some rules included in others. So in our network, for example, you know, we have rules that limit streaming video. We have a net object called excluded customers that we put some of our business customers in, schools, things like that. So when we're building a rule, we say, you know, exclude these users from these rules, um, and they don't get them applied to them. Or conversely, you could build a rule that would just, uh, you know, apply to that user. So it is pretty simple to have a rule that would travel with somebody. You just need a way to identify what that user is. So whether it's by IP or VLAN or, uh, you know, whatever, anything you can really identify them on. Um, okay, so last question I have right now. If you guys have any more, please send them in quick. Uh, was what is the interface on the Procera. So there's actually a number of different devices. I'll pull up the website real quick. So the most common ones that, that we've seen people deploy um, are the 7810 and the 8720. So on the 7810, it has gig interfaces built in. It'll do up to 5 gigs of traffic. We normally see people deploy this up to about 2 gigs before they switch to the 8720, and that's really... Um, from a cost perspective, you know, I mean, this box will handle 5 gigs of throughput. But this one's all 1 gig interfaces, and you can expand it with additional 1 gig. In the 8720, there is, a, uh, there is the ability to do 10 gig interfaces in here. You can see there's multiple expansion slots. So these boxes scale all the way up to this gigantic unit, which will do up to 320 gigs of throughput. So any of these units would integrate with PowerCode. Um, it's really just finding the one that's the best fit for each person's network. And really the 8720 and the 7810 are what we see the vast major majority of the time being deployed. And then they'll give you the option of both 1 or 10 gig. Um, 
Okay, so somebody asked to utilize the automation of billing within Power Code. Do you have to have both the Procera and BMU? Uh, you don't have to, no. So the Procera will do all of that rate limiting automatic redirection. You would probably want the BMU as well just to do the network monitoring and the DHCP and that kind of thing, but you would only utilize a single BMU in that scenario, and it would sit out of line in the network, and that could typically be one of our entry-level BMUs. So, um, you know, you'd set that off to the side, just connect it to your edge router or something, and, uh, and that would give you that functionality. Um, okay, one other question we had was um, about bursting, like kind of like the auto speed limiter in, in power code. So that's kind of like the volume-based shaping piece that Steve showed, where you can define a period of time and an amount of transfer, and then a policy that's enforced based on that. So, for example, you can say, if somebody passes, um, you know, 100 megs of traffic in 10 minutes, then rate limit them down to 2 megs. And when they're no longer um, matching that, right, they're no longer passing 100 megs of traffic over a 10-minute period, then we'll let them go back up. And you can have multiple steps, that policy. So that's volume-based shaping is what they call it within the Procera. And we're planning to build some stuff in the Power Code to help automate those volume-based shapers as well. But that's not in there uh, right away today. Um, somebody asked, will existing BMUs continue to function as they are now, or will a Procera be required for page redirects and shaping? So uh, to be clear, I don't know if I was clear on this, we're not abandoning any of the BMUs. Um, you can definitely keep using them. You don't have to use Procera. This is just an option. Um, you've seen kind of the power of this through the demonstration Steve did. It's really a way for us to bring things like Netflix limiting and um, you know peer-to-peer -peer and any of these other things you want to do into your network. You can keep using the BMU. If you bring a Procera in the network, there's really no value in having the BMU continue to do the rate limiting and redirection because the Procera device will do that for you. Um, but you can mix and match them as well. So you could have a Procera on one of your internet upstreams and a BMU on another one, and they'll both work in power code together to implement redirection and rate limiting, uh, you know, depending on which connection users come in through. Okay, so it looks like that's all the questions we got. Um, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add, Steve. Otherwise, I, uh, I think we're done. No, just thanks for uh, listening. Okay. Well, we did have a couple of people asking about, um, you know, pricing on the press service. It's very variable depending on the configurations. Um, you know, to give you some examples, sort of an entry-level 7810s in the range of about 20K. Um, but, you know, we, we are a reseller for Procera, so it's pretty simple for anybody that's looking at getting a box. You can just give us a call or shoot us an email, and we'll get together the specs of what you're looking for, and we can get a quote together for you. Um, so we did get one other question. The last one I think we'll take is, is the Procera something a network guy would have to monitor on a daily basis? Uh, would we need someone just to work with us? So I no, I don't think so. You know, the initial no. setup. You'd really go in and configure the rules and the stats as you want, and you'd really only look at it if you're looking for some data. It's going to sit there much like the BMU would today and just do its job. Um, you know, we really log into ours if we need some information, if we're trying to troubleshoot and the data and as useful, or if we want to look at the statistics or, you know, we want to implement a new rule or something. But, you know, day to day, it's not something we're really, we're really playing with a whole lot. Okay. Um, well, thanks a lot to everyone for coming. We did record this. So we'll be online if you want to review it. And if you have any other questions or, you know, you want to get a pricing quote or you want to know more about the integration or anything like that, feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email, and we'll get back to you as quick as we can. Thanks, guys.